Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I wanted to highlight creativity. Now, let me start out by saying there are a lot of misconceptions about creativity, specifically that you, the listener, are not a creative person. I disagree. I think every person listening right now is creative beyond their own knowledge. In fact, there is a psychologist, Scott Barry Kaufman, that in 2014 did a study to determine where we, as humans, have our most creative moments. The findings? 72% of people globally get their best ideas in the shower. According to Kaufman, this is because a nice long shower frees your mind from critical thought and allows it to wander and roam free through new perspectives and necessary distractions, opening up your mind to new ideas. Kaufman was later quoted as saying, A shower is quite literally a place of incubation, a change of scenery from the rest of your everyday lives that's relatively free of stimulation and distraction. In this episode, I interview a creator who found his shower, figuratively speaking, in coffee shops. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. The Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. and grassroots in 2015. Please welcome the owner of the social media handle Coffee Feed, Giovanni Falari. All right, Giovanni. I like that name. Man, that is nice. The owner of Coffee Feed. I'm really excited about this one because this is a very, very, very unique uh, uh, platform, what you're doing and kind of the creation of it. But first, let's introduce the world. Who is Gio? Who is Gio? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm very glad to be here. So, yeah. So, who's Gio? Gio is a guy from San Francisco, California, who grew up during the hyphy movement. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I wanted the dreads and the gold ones. <laughs> it did not come in for me, though. So, I'm bald today. So, um, but nah. So, I grew up in San Francisco. Um, bounced around a lot. Uh, we used to live in Sicily when I was a kid. I used to live in San Antonio, Texas. I moved back to Berkeley, California, then for the most part, lived in San Francisco. Um, went to a, an all boys private high school. Um, then moved on to Bowling Green State University. Played some football out there. Majored in telecommunications. You know, I was just a young guy trying to figure out my role in this world. You know, and then I just did a lot of moving, did a lot of traveling, and been in Portland since about 2015. So, yeah. so you said you lived in Sicily? Yeah. So my dad is Sicilian. So. Wow. So how long did you live there? Briefly, probably yeah. like a few months, maybe like a year or so. Okay. But it was so brief. I was speaking Italian. So oh, wow. I know. I That's was, awesome. I was bilingual for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's all gone now. So okay. Please don't ask me to say, <laughs> hey, let's have this conversation in Italian. Like, let's, let's <laughs> That's good because I don't know Italian either. So perfect. perfect. That, that makes two of us. <laughs> well, so, so uh, you know, you mentioned you uh, uh, actually went to Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. So... I played two years of football in college. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Two years of football in high school. And I really wanted to play football. I really wanted to go to the NFL. That was my dream. Football is oh, yeah. my favorite sport in the world. But I broke my leg twice in high school. Oof. Yeah. It was my freshman year, my sophomore year. Broke it twice. So Same leg? Same leg. Same. It's actually my shin. So, oh, ooh, ouch. Yeah. That's, that's a really hard bone to break. It is. <laughs> it's like one of the I hardest bones did to it break. Twice. <laughs> yeah. So you bang your shin on a coffee table or like oh, a, like a ledge. You think that hurts? Well, you try breaking it. Actually, oh. it hurts pretty bad. My leg just started hurting. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it gets cold, like it starts. Oh like, yeah. Uh, yep. It's still there. So I did break it twice, and 
I only played two years of high school football. So I was looking to go somewhere to where I can walk on. That's not like a powerhouse D1 school, Mm -hmm. you know, and they can get anybody that they want. So a friend of the family knew one of the coaches at Bowling Green State University. And I sent my film and they're like, hey, like he can come, you know, be a preferred walk on. He can, you know, join the team and then he'll be obviously a backup. He can try to earn a scholarship, you know, a little bit down the road, but we don't have any scholarships available. So I'm calling out. So I left San Francisco in August of 2005 uh, to move to Bowling Green, Ohio, which is about an hour south of Detroit. And I started going to school out there, playing football, and just trying to make it happen. Yeah. It, so let's let's talk about Coffee Feed. I kind of want to talk about it, and then I want to talk about how th- the creation happened. Yeah. Right. So let, let's let's talk about first. Let's give the audience a little bit. What is Coffee Feed? So Coffee Feed is a digital platform where I essentially focus on Portland coffee shops or just any local coffee shops in the current city that I'm in. So okay. I created it back in 2017, and I did it while I was actually unemployed. So. I moved up here in Portland to take a contract at Nike as a social media specialist and my contract finished and I was like, okay, like, what do I do now? Like I still, do I still want to live here? Do I want to work here? Do I move back to San Francisco? Like, what do I do? I ended up wanting to stay up here and wanting to stay at Nike, but I had a lot of free time on my hands. I was applying for jobs. I was just trying to just figure it out. And I started figuring it out at coffee shops. So I was applying for jobs. Um, I was, you know, fixing up my resume. I just needed to get out of the house at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was, it was just, you know I mean? Like you're you kind of getting your head at that moment, yeah. right? You're like, all right, like I'm qualified. Like I'm about, I'm like in my late twenties. So I have experience. Like I'm just struggling finding work. It was towards the end of 2016 where this was going on. So I'm like, all right, I can't get myself, I can't get down on myself. So right. I needed to kind of keep myself busy. I was in I was in a bunch of coffee shops. I was in Barista and Sisters Coffee. Those are the two coffee shops I was in the most. Okay. And I'm like, okay, like these are the coffee shops that I like. What else is out there? Like what other coffee shops are around? Is there and is there an Instagram account or any social media account that kind of profiles them? There wasn't. So I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of cool if someone made that account. And I was like, well, I can do that. I have yeah. all the free time in the world now. So <laughs> I created Coffee Feed um, initially just for coffee shop purposes and just taking pictures of coffee shops, like the interior, latte art, so on and so forth. But as I started going the first couple months, I kind of figured out that this would be a really good way to leverage social media to show marketing skills. Yeah. So I wanted to show that I can create digital assets. I wanted to show that I know how to do storytelling. I wanted to create a community I wanted to do all those things that are like, you know, some basic marketing principles that allows people to have like some sort of affinity and pride towards Portland coffee shops that creates a cadence of having people coming and seeing uh, what new shops are out there, coffee events and so on and so forth. So you were almost kind of created like a, a digital resume. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. It was a digital resume. That's exactly what it was. It was showing that. I could do brand marketing things similar to what Nike was doing, just on a severely smaller scale. So that's all that was. And it was something that I 1 million percent brought to my interview. I yeah. showed samples of it, um, how we can create a call to action from, hey, like going through digital, talking about an event. Like I remember we did a fundraiser for uh, – relief efforts in, from Puerto Rico when there was a hurricane out there, right? Oh, yeah, yep. So me and a couple of friends of mine, uh, Ian from Dead Stock Coffee, Erica from Cafe Arena, we hosted it at her shop. We had a karaoke party. And nice. And we raised funds, and we raised, like, almost $1,000. Wow, wow. That's a that's nice. Now, how, how do you – so you, you did this, right? You created a – how do you generate new ideas? That's a great question. Um, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to, uh, here's the thing. So it is so easy to like 
get in your head about these kind of things, yeah. like, like anything creative or trying to be innovative because you're like, nah, I can't do that. That's whack. Like, mm. nah, like, I think just paying attention to the trends that's going on, like, okay, like, for example, like, let's say TikTok, for example, right? So, like, I definitely at first was like, I am not hopping on TikTok. <laughs> what am I doing now? I am on TikTok. <laughs> I Man, am, I am my my team. wife is trying to get me on TikTok so bad. Yeah, like, like I ain't doing it. I ain't doing yeah. these dances. Corvette, Corvette, like all that. Like I, <laughs> I, um, I didn't do that. But um, what it is showing me, I think what it showed me is that very often, like there are people who just do things because they like, they think it's a good idea and they like it. And I think I had to get to the point of where. It doesn't have to be perfect to post. It doesn't have to be a perfect plan. It doesn't have to be anything that is like well thought out 100%. Mm-hmm. It just got to be something that I think is dope or something that's cool, whether it's, I don't know, like talking about latte art or yeah. talking about shops that are open. Like I may not have the complete list of what shops are open on like Christmas or Thanksgiving, but you know, at least putting the majority of it out there right. so we can get the conversation started. Right. In fact, you know, I, I think it's important too, for the folks at home to understand, like, let's, let's talk about how big and kind of the, the draw, where, where is coffee feed at? And where did you kind of looking back on it? Where was that like pivotal moment where you're like, Whoa, this is, this is something. Um, yeah. So from where it started, how I didn't know anybody in the coffee industry, I didn't know any baristas to like now, like almost like, like 8,000, 10,000 followers on the gram. and decent amount on Twitter and TikTok. I think the moment where I saw things kind of turn was when I got invited to a specialty coffee association expo that was usually six, $700 for a ticket or like for a pass. And I got free uh, media credentials for it. Wow. So that was probably like the first time that I was like, okay, cool. Like, let me submit coffee feed as a part of the media. And they're like, yeah, come on out just use this pass and then you'll be fine. It's free for the few days that you're here. Wow. And I was like, that's pretty dope. Cause I think that's like kind of like the start. And then the name recognition when I was around, they're like, Oh yeah, I've seen you on the gram or I've seen you like on social media. You did some work with Sprudge, which is a media organization, a coffee media organization that I work with, wrote, I've written a few articles about them mm-hmm. and did some Instagram takeovers for them as well. So I think it was the moment where I was able to, get media credentials for expo events and then also have the opportunity to monetize coffee knowledge. Mm, nice. So, nice. Cause that's something you've, you've, you said you were a barista at first, correct? You've done never worked in coffee. None. I've never worked in coffee. So it's just, your you're just, you know, affinity for going to these locations kind of be created this like for it. Yeah. So, okay. So let's take it back a little bit. So my dad, Sicilian man, yeah. like, moved to the States when he was like 20 something, loved his espresso at the mocha pot going, right? He's like, Giovanni, uh, make a couple of shots of espresso. Like, that's what you do that, like, constantly, right? So I'm like, all right. So I'm like 10, 11, 12 years old, you know, making his espresso so he can get his little double shot and then go on to work. I'd, I'd maybe make a little bit extra. Maybe I'd take a little sip. But it was very customary just in our family just to, for everyone to drink espresso, right? I mean, eventually, like, you know, as we got older, it's like, nah, it's not really my thing. Or like, no, I love espresso. So... I never stopped liking coffee after that. I went, I went to Starbucks all the time growing up. Uh, there was a Starbucks right next to my bus stop in high school. So I ended up. <laughs> okay, so let's go really deep. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, I had the hugest crush on a barista at Starbucks. Uh, so the truth <laughs> comes <laughs> the out. The truth comes out. When did Gio like coffee? Um, there was this one barista. It always starts with the girl, man. <laughs> So, um, okay. So like I would make espresso for my dad and that was true. Like I, and I would drink espresso as a kid and, you know, as a young teenager, but there was this one girl that worked at the Starbucks that was right next to my bus stop. And I liked her a <laughs> lot. She was so cool. She was in college, you know, she went to the university of San Francisco. So it was like, which is like a block away from where we lived growing up. And then, you know, where the Starbucks was. And she was super nice and super friendly. And me just being completely naive. I'm like, oh, she just, you know, she likes me, right? Yeah, she likes me. She's super nice. She remembers my name. And she's like. She wrote it on the cup. She wrote my name on the cup. 
she yelled it out and smiled <laughs> when my mocha frappuccino was ready. And I'm like, this is this this uh, this is she love. She made it just how I like. Just oh man, how I liked it. This is love. <laughs> I listen, but this is, this is it. Like I'm, I'm going to oh, yeah. be in her for the rest of my life. Right. Um, so, uh, I just didn't realize that that's just great customer service <laughs> and the building of a brand affinity on the, on behalf of Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Um, long story short, she, um, I saw her on her off day in that Starbucks and I'm like, Oh, Hey, what she's doing here? And she was like, cuddled up with her boyfriend. Oh, um, I was, man. I was shook. <laughs> My heart was broken. But I still have the coffee. But I still, like, and you know what? Like, <laughs> the I, coffee ain't going to break me it, like that. It, no, nope, coffee has never let me down. Never, never, never. No, nah, but like, yeah, mocha frappuccinos didn't taste the same for a while. That but. is amazing. So so how did you then leverage coffee feed? Because you you eventually, you're now at Nike, yes. right? Right. So you, you re-landed a position at Nike. So how did you leverage, for the folks at home, I think this is a great learning point. How did you leverage that to get the job? Great question. So I used, so my first stint at Nike was from June of 2015 to to September of 2016. And I learned a lot about social media stuff and just basic like digital things that Nike was doing. I was listening into marketing meetings and, you know, digital brand meetings and so on and so forth. I took what I knew at the moment and just kind of applied it to coffee feed Mm. and then vice versa. So I would also find learnings through coffee feed and then apply it to some of the things that I would see through social media when I would get my, eventually get my second contract at Nike. So my second contract with Nike was still in consumer services from February, 2017 until May of 2018. And I leveraged coffee feed to first and foremost, just gain confidence in knowing what I'm doing, like growing something from the ground up and just have the opportunity to use a platform to storytell. That's really what we do a lot at Nike through the brand marketing side. So just recently working with um, the NFL and the Girls Flag Football Initiative or working with Florida A&M University and LeBron James. Like at the end of the day, it is still the concept of storytelling through a digital platform that the masses can easily digest. Yeah. So I was doing that just on a, a smaller scale through Coffee Feed. I was taking pictures. I was telling stories about uh, baristas of color. Mm-hmm. I was telling the stories about owners, uh, just deep dives on these coffee shops that would essentially bridge the gap between people who are really into the coffee industry and then those who are really much into coffee at all. Yeah. Was there ever a moment like when you started Coffee Feed and you're kind of going through that process of like self-doubt and like, man, I'm wasting my time. What am I doing? All the time. Really? Literally, like I, I have self-doubt. I have self doubt constantly <laughs> like, man, like I'm kind of stuck on this at, it seems like I'm stuck at this follower count or whatever, like, or I'm stuck. I feel like my grid is looking the same as it has for like the last two years, or I haven't had anything really original or pop off in like the last like six to eight months. Like there's a lot of self doubt. Things move so fast and social media can get really dangerous for a lot of people because it can make you believe that you're behind the curve. I think a lot of things on social media um, makes you feel that you are behind, you're behind the curve. Mm -hmm. Everyone's doing better than you. Um, People just really good at really showing the best side of themselves. So they're not really showing the downfalls. They're not showing the bad days. They're not showing, you know what I mean? Unless it's like something that they do, but social media can be a really dangerous place. So there's also, like someone for myself that I'm like, you know, there's other coffee accounts that are blowing up or there are like other people who are showing a different side of coffee shops that I may have not seen before. Like, and I doubt myself, not every, every day, but like there are some times where I'm like, man, like yeah. what could I be doing? Yeah. You, you, so like, you know, for the folks at home, cause I think this is bringing just an important subject, you know, social media and I think your, your expertise in it. Everybody thinks there's the golden ticket to, you know, fame, right? On, on social media. Is there a golden ticket to fame? How, how do I get the hundred thousand followers? I want, I want a million people listening to this podcast right now. How do I do it? Yeah. So, uh, the golden ticket is time and consistency. I mean, or just having an unlimited amount of resources of some sort, whether it's like money so you can buy followers or, 
I mean, like, unless it's like something like really niche or if you have a very popular friend group or what have you, I think it's, um, I think what happens on social media is that we often see stories about people going viral. And then from there, they get the opportunity to have a larger platform, which is supported by larger companies. And it's not always like that. Mm. Um, I think just from the Nike side, obviously we work a lot with athletes and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on making themselves in tip top shape. We work with you know, organizations and clubs that, you know, that are large brands themselves. And I think that with social media, the draw is that people want to, people want to be instant stars. Yeah. They've seen examples of it, but at the end of the day, People are able to viral stars for a reason just because they kind of fizzle out and they don't maintain consistency for a long extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what advice would you have for those, you know, those young individuals or even older individuals that, you know, for better or worse are looking for that clout right on, on, on the social media, what advice would you have for them? Uh, Stay authentic because I think with clout, people lose authenticity really quickly. So if it's, you know, someone doing random stuff on TikTok or people going above and beyond to put the best photo on the gram. Like, I think authenticity goes the long way, goes a very long way. And I think when you think of clout, a lot of the time it goes hand in hand with a lack of authenticity or it goes hand in hand with people just not really being true to themselves or just not really just being, not just, you know what I mean? Like not aligning themselves that with society, I guess, because at the end of the day, when people are chasing clout, they are chasing fame. They're chasing something that they don't have and they're willing to do what they need to do to um, get themselves to that next step. It's like, I mean, this is, it's kind of like, you know, the kid from Joe a bear, right? Like he was chasing clout. Like he wanted to be like the best reseller in the world. Um, (laughs) so, you know, like, and you know, that people want, people want to be, People don't want to be famous and they see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now what, what, like, what would you say? Is it, is it just as easy as, as somebody to kind of go, like, for example, starting coffee feed, was it just as easy as literally going and starting a social media account and begin posting and, and that, you know, for the folks at home that maybe aren't familiar with social media, what, and you also mentioned um, one of the things you did to kind of help boost your, your, you know, kind of brand was doing the media piece, right? What other avenues besides the social media could individuals at home think about to kind of help exploit that social media brand? Repeat that question. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So think about like, for example, you, you mentioned earlier that you were, you did the media thing, right? So you basically put coffee feed as a media entity, Mm -hmm. Is there other things that you've done to kind of help grow coffee feed kind of like other channels? Yes. So just going out in person for one is something that I did, like actually meeting people in real life. Obviously COVID doesn't really make, gives up, give us the yeah. opportunity to do that at this moment, but going out in real life, did writing, uh, worked back with non-traditional uh, like companies, I guess, like Portland Monthly, for example. Oh, nice. Had the opportunity yeah. to work with them and get featured in the, in their article. Um, I think aside from like, primarily I do a lot of my stuff through social media, but at the end of the day, um, just going out and yeah. dapping up people at coffee shops and saying, what's up? Yeah. And just the word of mouth, like and talking to like-minded people. How important is your network when you're growing your, your brand? It's pretty important, but it's also a ref, like your network is also a reflection of you too. Mm. So I think a lot of people really don't understand that when they think like network, they're like, Oh, your, your network is your net worth. Like, so it must be, it has to be like huge. Right. Like I need to grow right. it as big and far as wide as I can. But at the end of the day, your network is a reflection of you. They say that you are the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Yes. I've been talking about that on this podcast actually quite a bit. Exactly. So, and it is very true. Mm-hmm. Like who you run with and who you talk to all the, talk to all the time, you're going to, you're going to bounce things off each other. You're going to feed off each other. You're going to reflect each other's values and thoughts all the time. Yeah. So if your network is suspect or if your network 
is inconsistent, then you have a high likelihood of being inconsistent as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It makes sense. You know, it's the, you know, kind of improving the averages, right. For the average. And now what would you say is the kind of the hardest part uh, about running? Cause you, you work full time. Yeah. Right. And now you have, you have coffee feed, which, which is pretty successful now. Mm. What would you say is the difficulty of it? The difficulty of it would be time management and getting in those moments where I don't, feel like I have to do something or I feel like I have to do something. I think there's some times where I'm just tired, right? Yeah, like, yep. like there are some projects that I'm landing full time at work. I may not be able to hit a coffee shop before they close. I've, and sometimes I just don't want to leave the house or sometimes I just don't feel like editing a photo. I don't feel like throwing up, you know, Adobe Lightroom and getting it done. But at the end of the day, I think just making sure that I create boundaries that allow me to rest that allows me to get in a better mental health space because when I get anxious or when I get into a mode where I don't think I can do everything and I just don't do anything at that point, I just kind of sit there and just wallow around like, all right, what's, what do I do next? I just have to remind myself that, you know, I may not be able to do everything, but I can do something at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So looking back on everything, you know, taking it all the way back to Sicily. Yeah. What advice would you give a, a younger Geo? I don't have to have all the answers figured out to continue to move forward. When I look back at my journey specifically from high school up until now, I think that a lot of people really feel like they have to get a job in a major that they want, that they uh, majored in or they took classes in. Um, I think they feel like they have to get a five on a high five, you know, six figure job immediately out of college so they can start paying student loan debt so they can make their time in college worth it. I think people feel like they have to love their job immediately. I think people feel like they have to get a job that they can settle in for years and, you know, get the family with the white picket fence and all that stuff. I went to a random school that wasn't even my radar in my junior year in high school. I walked onto a football team. I spent five years at college. I majored in telecommunications and I did radio, but I didn't do anything telecommunications related after I graduated college. I got into sales. I was doing 100% commission sales for four years after I graduated college because that's all I could get when I was done. I didn't have the time to intern as much because I was playing college football and they that required a lot of our time and it was in Bowling Green, Ohio. There wasn't really anything for us to really intern at and digital internships weren't really a thing back then. So I graduated from college. I take a job. I kind of just settle into it because this is like, all right, well, this is my life now. I was learning the difference between being a collegiate athlete and just being thrust into the real world. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I just knew that I was severely unhappy with my job and I wasn't making as much money because I was working hundred percent commission sales. Mm. So I think a lot of people think they have to like know everything and like just be on point. But for me, it took me hitting like rock bottom mm. and hating everything for it to really crystallize what I wanted to do. So from there I quit sales jobs and I just moved back home and I was like, all right, let me start coaching or something so I can, you know, just get back to football, mainly sports, but like mainly just helping people. And then from there, I applied for a Nike job and didn't hear back from them until four months later. And they're like, yo, you apply for this job. <laughs> um, it's taken up, but there's another job that might be ready for there, that you might be better fit for. So let's chat. And I moved up six weeks later. Nice. So looking back, you're just like looking back, like, looking back, it was the journey was worth it. But yeah. I just think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to always have the answers and mm-hmm. to always like like tell ourselves that we're happy with our current situation. I just, once I recognized that I wasn't happy with my current situation and I wasn't like trying to like please other people, yeah. it was, it, it started to turn around. What'd you do it again? Would you do it all again? You, to do what I'm doing now? Absolutely. Yeah. I would. Hey, I, you I, know what? You know, I got to ask you, man. What, what was, what's the best coffee? The best coffee. <laughs> Can I give you like a top five? <laughs> Can we, we do top five. Okay. I don't want you to get in trouble. Yeah. Um, top five. So dead stock coffee, La Perlita, good coffee, uh, 
the barista. That's my number five right now. This is interchangeable, by the way. Okay, yeah. So, let's see. That's not. I'm going to go push pull coffee. Push pull. Yeah. There you go. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, there's the top five. Gio said it. Top oh, five, boy. man. Top, top five. five. So, Gio, let the folks know at home how can they kind of get in contact with Coffee Feed? Where can they find it at? Where, where can they follow you? I think follow me at underscore Coffee Feed on Instagram, Coffee Feed PDX on Twitter, and just Coffee, coffee Feed on TikTok. Also, hit me up on LinkedIn if you have any Nike questions or just any coffee questions at uh, Giovanni Falari. And then G-I-F-I-L-L-A-2 is my personal IG. Nice. Gio Falari from Sicily. Thank you again. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the